Amen. You can be seated. First thing I want you to notice is, and James starts off talking about faith, I mean, uh, patience having her perfect work. And, and oftentimes in the Bible, we see this idea about the Lord's building something up in us, right? He's building up, a, 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 he's pr trying to perfect us and get us to the next stage of maturity in the Christian life. Everybody agree with that? <clears throat> something I noticed, uh, you know, Christian life, God doesn't necessarily deal with everybody in the exact same way, you know. Uh, he deals with you where you are. He knows what your, where your heart is. He knows what your background is. He knows what your abilities are and what you're capable of doing. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, a growing process where when you commit something to the Lord, at a, at a, when you're just newly saved and you commit something to the Lord, it's like you're seeing Him bless you for the, that commitment. Now, many years later, you should have progressed as a Christian. I mean, if you're just standing still in your Christian walk, you're not you're not really drawing closer to the Lord. You're you're not doing anything, and so so when we when we draw closer to the Lord and we and we begin to grow and uh, and be perfected. Now I know we haven't reached perfection. Nobody would claim that, but experience, you know, all these types of things builds you up. Now God's got kind of a a different expectation out of you, and so. Uh, you know, I, th I thought about, again, with the subject of tithing, I talked a little bit about tithing earlier. You know, I, I remember when somebody in our church, they had just come, they were on fire uh, for the Lord. They wanted to, they, you know, make up for lost time because for so many years they didn't do anything for the Lord. And they're like, man, I got to start doing something for the Lord. And so they were getting plugged in to various uh, things that they could do. Uh, it's an older, older person. And so they were writing letters to people and, and cards and just trying to get involved. And I remember the first time uh, this lady came to me and said, you know, I finally decided to start tithing. Now, as a, somebody who's been tithing for many, many years, because I grew up being taught that, to me, it's like no big deal. Like, that's, duh, that's something everybody does. But for her, it was stepping out on faith. I haven't done this before. Now I'm going to do it. And she came to me like the next week and said, you wouldn't believe it. Now, look, I'm not trying to sound Pentecostal here. <laughs> this is how the Lord was working in her life. She said, you wouldn't believe it. The Lord blessed me with like that same amount of money that I gave. Like he blessed where I was allowed to have that money just unexpectedly. Somebody sent a, a, a check or something like that. Now, I know from experience, God's worked that way in my life. And the opposite is true too. And I, again, I don't, I don't try to pound on people. You know, uh, they've, they've got to walk with the Lord and not try to do anything to impress me or impress somebody else. They've got to do what's right between them and God. But where I've dealt, where God's dealt with me in my life, I remember when I was newly married, uh, it was like, man, I budget is tight, you know, and all this, and it was hard for me to sometimes to to let go of that. And I'm thinking, man, I just there's rich people in the church; they could take care of it. You know, we were in a place with some some wealthy folks, and I'm thinking they can take care of it. You know, let the one percent, <laughs> you know, like our our government. I mean, like our, uh, like socialists say, and I don't think any, uh, you know, but, but I knew in my heart, I need to be contributing. I need to be doing something. And so I kind of would step out and I'd, and I, I would experience the same thing. Now, like I said, I was taught early on about tithing, but once I got married and the money wasn't there, then I started to have fear, but the Lord began to show me that, you know what, you can hoard your money. And I can make it to, it's kind of like what, what uh, Habakkuk, you know, I can put holes in those in the bag. Like you're putting up money in your bag and it's got a hole in it and money's just falling out. Right? I can do that. Or I, you can give up and say, man, I don't know what I'm going to do for my next meal. And God can show himself and provide for you, right? Because where you are, he knows that you've stepped out on faith and you've tried to do that. And so he begins to, uh, to help you with that. Now, later on in your life, it may be so like just second nature, you just don't even think about it anymore, right? You just know you get your paycheck, boom, this is my time. You know, it might be that God would impress on somebody to go above and beyond. Maybe somebody else out in a secret way. You know, the Bible says not let, when you're giving alms, not to let, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You know, that an alms would be kind of like helping somebody out and not, not telling anybody about it. And so 
Maybe somebody would want to help in that way. Maybe they would want to give above and beyond or something like that. And God would be placed that, you know, don't let anybody force you to do that. You only give as you have opportunity and as the Lord provides and wants you to do that. But you might decide between you and God that that's what he wants you to do. And you do that and you see that he begins to bless you. Right. Why? Because it is a and it doesn't matter, like the person that just started giving, Lord blessed him person who's been given for many, many years, but he decides to step out a little bit more. And this is where, you know, we I've preached before on the faith promise and how I'm not big on the faith promise. And it kind of, it kind of got people who, you know, it was like forcing them and making them feel guilty and they had to give their every last penny and all that, or else they weren't really, they didn't really love the Lord or something. And that's nonsense. Okay. I would never try to pressure somebody to do that. But some of that came from stories from people who had been serving the Lord for many, many years and they felt like in their heart, God would have them to do more. And so they did more and they said, wow, God blessed me even more for doing that. And so then they share that story and these young people that just started giving, are like, oh man, what, I got to give everything? Kind of like Barnabas, you know, and those in the early church that just sold everything and gave all their possessions. You know, you, I don't know how many actually did that. I know Ananias and Sapphira claimed that they were, <laughs> but you see, even that. Peter said, hey, that was in your power to give. You didn't have to give all that. That was between you and God. And so the reason that God punished them is because they lied to the Holy Ghost and said that they were doing something and they, and they held back, you know. So don't, you know, they were wanting to be seen of men. They were wanting people to lift them up and say, wow, look how spiritual they are. Well, that's wicked, okay. But what I'm saying is that God has a process in your life. So it's like kind of like having children and knowing where they are individually, like, uh, I was the type of child who, if I got straight C's, my mom and dad would have been like, wow, congratulations. You really worked hard, man. You got straight C's on your report card, right? But not everybody's that way. You know, I don't actually remember what they expected of my sister, but I think it was quite a bit more because she has showed that she could make better grades. And so they had a higher expectation for her, you know, same with my kids. They grew at different speeds. Right? I don't want to embarrass Zachary, but I remember a time they say girls tend to mature faster than boys. <laughs> I remember a time where she was kind of growing faster and he was kind of struggling in school. And I thought, you know, there could be a time where she kind of rises up and is able to do things that he's not able to do. And I didn't want him to be discouraged about that. Hey, you keep doing the best that you can do. Right now, I might say, what are you doing getting bees? Right. You can do better than that. I'm I'm not that kind of, <laughs> but anyway, I probably should be, but I could, I, you could do better than that, right? What are you doing getting B's? Whereas Zachary might be a little more like me. I'm like, Hey, you got all C's. Good job. And it, I'm, it, I'm not trying to pick on my kids, but you understand what I'm saying? You deal with kids differently based on what you can expect. Of. And the Lord does that too. Here's another example. Soul winning. Okay. I remember when I tried to start a soul winning program in Iola, I was a youth pastor and I was like, man, a lot of the older people are not going out knocking doors, not seeing a lot of this done. I know it needs to get done. And I'm like, why not teach the teens how to do that? And so the first thing I, I taught them, and I know you're going to say, well, that's not soul winning. And you're right. But first thing I taught them was, well, let's just pass out tracks. Let's just knock on, door, you know, give people tracks and say, hey, we'd love to have you come to our church. I hope you can read this or something. I just wanted to get them to take that first step. You know, the first time they did that, one boy came back to church and he had been going to the church for a while and he had just never been involved in this and he said he was so nervous because this lady came out at the door and he was hoping to just kind of the track on the door and run you know <laughs> and so she came to the door and he was so nervous and he's like I stu stumbled over my words and I didn't know what to say but I basically just simply invited her to church and I gave her a track and that Sunday she came and he came just beaming just smiling and saying saying, hey, that lady that I, yeah, that I invited, she came, right? And so this is something I've seen in my life. Oh, <laughs> my, I'm getting old, man. My knees are falling apart. <laughs> so this is something I've, I've experienced in my life. Now, the, uh, that doesn't seem like much. And so you'd say, like, well, why would God bless that? Now, let me say this. If I, in my current state right now, if that's all that I did, if I went back and said, you know what? Door knocking's not working. Let's just blitz and just go. I don't think God would bless that at all, right? But when they did that, God blessed. 
Now, I don't understand this. Let me tell you this principle I've learned a long time ago. Now, we have knocked a lot of doors. We've seen a lot of people saved. Right. We haven't seen a lot of those folks who got saved to church. I don't know why that is. Right? That's just between, you know, we're just doing what we can do. Okay? Uh, and the Lord, here's what the Lord will do, though. I've seen this in my life many times where I step out and, I, and I'm inviting folks to church. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm, I'm trying to get people saved. Maybe I'm seeing some saved. They don't begin to come to church, but you know what God does? He'll send us, He'll send the church other people who are ready to learn and grow. All right? You know I've seen that. <laughs> you guys, I believe, are a result of that uh, from my perspective because I'm praying for laborers and I'm doing work, and then all of a sudden God sends some guys. It's not the one that I led to the Lord. But see, that's a way of God saying, look, I'm the one in control, not you. But he knows the effort. He knows what we're doing. And so when we step up and we increase our faith and we say, all right, Lord, we're going to do more for you, not less. He says, all right, I'm going to give you more now, more responsibility, more for you to do. And so the Christian walk and growing in, uh, in perfection or maturity, if you will, is all about going through these tests, right? What did James say? You know, he's counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, right? So, so it's all about tests. It's all about growing and not, not going back to where you were and not stay, staying stagnant, but trying to take that next step in your Christian walk. Now, look, you have this mindset maybe that, hey, yeah, but people that do that, they get super spiritual and they think that they're better than... No, because actually that's part of growing is learning how not to be that way. <laughs> you know, see what I'm saying? And so we're growing. We're finding ways to get closer to the Lord and to be more humble and to walk with God the way that uh, he, the Bible tells us to do. Now go to James 1.26. The part of this chapter I want to focus on is it talks about the tongue. Among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is, in, is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Look at chapter 3. James 3, verse 2. For in many things we offend... Oh, he's talking about... what is The word is used, masters, but it's talking about teachers, right? People that would be teaching people the word of God and many things we offend all if any man offend not in word also to bridle the whole body and the rest of the chapter talks about controlling the tongue the tongue is a powerful tool okay it's a powerful uh, worker of iniquity really if we're not careful but it can also be a good thing we use the our tongue to preach the gospel and to get to, uh, to be an encouragement to others and all that. So the tongue can be a good thing. But what he says right here is if you're going to be a perfect, mature Christian, you've got to learn how to control the tongue. It's vital. It's important that we do that. Bridling the tongue is essential for spiritual growth. And what I want to talk about in this message tonight, the sermon tonight is about the word gossip, okay? So the title of the message is A Biblical Perspective on Gossip. Biblical Perspective on Gossip. Now, anybody know how many times in the Bible the word, this is a trick question, how many times in the Bible the word gossip is used? Zero, okay? The word gossip itself is used zero, unless it's written in a different way and I didn't know. But uh, And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of for sake, just for a, a teaching moment, okay? Because I looked this up, I had no idea. The word gossip, where does it come from? Well, basically, you can check the etymology of the English word gossip, and it comes from the word God, right, and sib. Sib, like sibling, okay? God and sib. Is that gossip? It's interesting. It's one of those interesting words that over history evolved it to mean something else. But that original word, you think of like sibling or family, Right, and, and and it had to do with a godfather, right? Well, we would say somebody who was uh, accountable to, or let's see, uh, they were like, uh, you know, family, but not real family. I mean, you think about the God, the, the mafia, the Godfathers, right? You know, they're they're like the they're they're not real family. God, they're family, maybe the mafia, but 
But the, the, that's where the word comes from, the God Father. Okay, so, so they're they're really, anyway. So that seems like we're a weird history, a weird origin for this word. And it later on became to mean that person whom you are in sweet fellowship with, and you will sit around and you'll talk with them about whatever, you know. And then you can see kind of from that where the word gossip would come, because this is what they would do. They just sit around. These are my folks. These are my people. We'll, we'll we we talk about things. I mean, think barbershop. <laughs> you ever been to a barbershop? I mean, they go in there and they're like old women, man. They just sit around and they talk about other people. <laughs> they talk about uh, all those things. And uh, it's a idea. Uh, and then eventually it became known as basically someone who would delve into another person's business that's not their own. Webster's 1828 says this. Gossip... Uh, is it as a noun right what is gossip it is a, a person it's a sponsor one who answers baptism godfather that's what i was uh, that's what i was talking about that's the actual but then it says thing is i had to look it up drinking like with your buddies and you drink you drink. This, uh, uh, this is your gossip that's my drinking buddy. I mean, that's where the word came from. And then here's definition three, Webster's Dictionary, 1828. One who runs from house to house, tattling and telling news, an idle tattler. This is the sense, this is Webster talking here, this is the sense in which the word is now used. So even in 1828, they're saying the history of this word is that it became known as a tattler or a talebearer all these kinds of things. Okay, that's that's what the the word now means. Number 4 says a friend or neighbor. Number 5 says mere tattle or idle talk. And then as a verb, the word means to prate, which means to just talk foolishly or for a tedious length of time, to chat, to talk much, to run about and tattle and tell idle tales. You know, I remember in school our teachers would say, "All right, quit gossiping." And I was always thinking, well, we're not talking bad about anybody, but she was just saying, hey, quit idle chatter, right? You know. And so these, these are the ways uh, that, the, that the word is actually used. But when I say gossip, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Growing up, that, that was a subject that was preached a lot. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the whole judge not, you know. Uh, and so there was a lot of preaching on that. And, hey, you think you're spiritual, but yet you sit around and you gossip about people and all that. Uh, just from my perspective, maybe it's still being preached in a lot of places, but from my perspective, I feel like it's a subject that's not preached on very much anymore. And I can imagine probably why. Because I had a hard time deciding I was going to I'm guilty of gossip. I like to sit around with the guys and begin to gossip. And sometimes that gossip is talking about other people and pointing out certain faults or whatever. And then later on, I feel guilty and think, man, that probably wasn't right of me to do that. But it feels good to talk about other people, kind of build your common, uh, you know, commonality with one another. Well, we're better than those people over there, right? If we're not careful, that's what we begin to do with our tongue because it makes us feel good. So consider the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Okay, so look, we should love to use our tongue for good things, to lift people up, to preach the gospel, to sing praises to God and all these, right? We should love that. But also death is in the power of the tongue. And if well, just think about it. it, it only takes one false accusation to condemn a man, right? I mean, if a, if a person says, hey, we find the defendant guilty, right? He could be condemned to a lifetime of imprisonment or even the death penalty or whatever by one person's word, right? And the same is true, maybe not to that extent, but the same is true about one man's ministry. We could say one bad thing about that person, and now everybody that we know believes what we said and they don't actually check with that person or research what that person actually does or what he believes or whatever. It's just all of a sudden, ah, hang him. <laughs> we don't want him anymore in our fellowship, right? And it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> because of one accusation, right? We got to be real careful about that. 
I know there's a time to pronounce judgment. You know, there's a time to say, hey, we, this person needs to be marked, all that kind of stuff. But if we're not careful, we can communicate some, some evil things. And really, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about the tongue, we're talking about the way, the message we're giving, the communication that we're giving about somebody or, or about something. And so, uh, for instance, I mean, I could cut my tongue out. <laughs> I got to exercise my tongue, try to speak better, you know, have, be, have better uh, pronunci pronunciation, and uh, I'm not good at it now. <laughs> I got to cut my tongue out, and I'd still be able to communicate a message, right? You walk around with a, with, with, with a, you go into a store right now and see everybody with masks on, you're like, I can't tell what they're saying. Right. They're not communicating a message. They can communicate a message with their eyes. What's this mean? You know, I just communicated a message. <clears throat> you could tell your kids to do something, and they go, well, <laughs> you said something, even though you didn't say it with your mouth. You, you, could, you just showed your heart and attitude by the look on your face, rolling of the eyes and all that. You're communicating a message, okay? And the reason I say that is to make sure that you understand, hey, it's not, you can say, well, I didn't say anything. Yeah, but you could still communicate a message. And, and let me give you a, uh, an example. <clears throat> If you write something, really the power of the tongue, right? That's about, what is that old saying? It said, I don't know who came up with it, but it says, the pen is mightier than the sword, right? A lot can be decided. Again, one signature could condemn somebody. One accusation on, you know, that's in writing could condemn somebody. So writing can be just as bad or just as gossipy. Uh, as communicating with each other, calling on the phone, going knocking on doors like you might think that uh, somebody does when they're a terror. But you know what is just as dangerous? Social media. Uploading something on social media, gossiper. <laughs> you know, getting on there and condemning somebody and saying, hey, so-and-so did this or that, gossiper. I mean, it's the same. It's, the, it's the still communicating a message. And we got to be real careful about that because there is considerable amount of power that you have in the words that you communicate. And so the Bible has a lot to say about our communication. And I'm going to get to some of those verses here in a second. But my first point is this. The Bible doesn't use the word gossip, but the Bible calls gossipers whispers, talebearers. I think all these apply. Tattlers, idle talkers, and backbiters. That sounds like a good definition of gossip, right? Let me read it again. Whisperers, what are they doing? They're gossiping, all right? I don't even, it doesn't even really matter what they're talking about. They're probably gossiping. Tailbearers, can't wait to go tell the latest story about somebody. Tattlers, you know what he did, <laughs> you know? Uh, idle talkers, that'd be kind of like the whispers. Backbiters. We see all these kinds of things. So let me look at a couple of those script, a few of those scriptures here. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. And let's look at verse 20. 2 Corinthians 12, 20. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbiting, uh, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. I mean, he gives you just all these different words to explain different things you can do with the tongue, different things you can do to cause division, and things you can do to hurt, heart, harm somebody or, or their testimony or whatever. Okay, look at uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 28. Proverbs 16, 28, I'll just read it. A forward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. A whisperer separateth chief friends. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're, 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 you've got a, 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 a pal. You've got a good, close friend, right? And somebody starts spreading some gossip. You know, using their tongue to communicate some uh, some unrighteous communication, and that could actually separate you from your chief friend. <laughs> I mean, because one person's words weren't thought 
before they came out of their mouth, they didn't think about it. They didn't filter it. They didn't, they didn't stop and think how that might harm somebody. And that was the damage that can be caused by whispering and gossiping. Look at Leviticus 19. We like preaching from Leviticus 18, Leviticus 19, oh, Leviticus 20, 21. I mean, they're all good. <laughs> Leviticus 19, verse 15. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord." And so I like that, that visual picture of somebody going up and down as a talebearer among the people, right? just spreading gossip, just going around just t telling tales about people or, or the latest gossip that they heard. <clears throat> we ought not be like that. That's a, that's a damaging thing that, that, that we can do. It's definitely not something that's Christ-like, definitely not something that is a sign of a mature Christian, okay? Proverbs eleven thirteen says, A talebearer... Revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth a matter. Boy, wouldn't we do well just sometimes just, <laughs> just conceal a matter. Now look, I'm not saying, I, I think you understand my heart. I'm not saying don't speak out for righteousness sake. In fact, you could take that verse in Leviticus and say that's what that second half is saying. Like not, don't stand against the, the blood of your neighbor. I think I quoted that right. You could say that's kind of like the opposite, like don't go up and down in the streets, you know, telling a uh, uh, tail bearing on somebody. Also, don't stand against the blood. So, so, so you could look at that and say what he's saying is don't, don't, you know, co don't conceal a matter at the expense of somebody else being hurt or being, you know, you've got to, you got to stand up for righteousness and you got to expose wickedness. We got to reveal uh, the fact that somebody might be spreading false doctrine or something like that. But look, there's some steps. There's some important steps that should take place before you get to that point where you just get up and you start revealing uh, secrets and telling tales about people. Uh, you ought to really know, have dealt with that person. What's the Bible say? Go to them privately. That's a good place to start, right? And, uh, and try to uh, win your brother if you have found fault in him. So uh, that's a good thing to do. But look at Proverbs 6. Man, this is a tough one. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm telling you, we, we like hard preaching, right? Who in here likes hard preaching? I like hard I like loud preaching. I like beat the pulpit, slam your Bible preaching. Uh, I like spitting, sweating, standing on pulpits type preaching. But you know what really hard preaching is? Saying something that's hard to hear. <laughs> that's what hard preaching is. It doesn't have to be the volume. It doesn't have to be, you know, slamming something down. Now, look, I like it, and sometimes there's a time for it to get the point across. You know, there's a time to stand up and lift your voice like a trumpet and all that, I understand. But what a hard preaching really is is when somebody says something and it steps on your toes and you're like, I didn't like hearing that, right? That's the stuff that will run. Hey, if we're all in agreement on the reprobate doctrine and I get up here and preach hard on the reprobate doctrine and y'all go out and say, that was good preaching, that's because it didn't apply to you. <laughs> it didn't step on your toes, right? I start preaching about gossip, I'm stepping on my own toes. And so I got to, you know, this is hard preaching for me. <laughs> hard preaching against, uh, against me and I know others as well, okay? So uh, this is what hard preaching is. Now, where did I have you turn? Proverbs 6. Proverbs chapter 6, look at verse 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. You say, God doesn't hate. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Okay, but these are things. He doesn't hate people. He hates, he hates the sin and loves the sinner. Let us read. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, all right, that's a sin. A lying tongue, that's a sin. And hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And 
he that soweth discord among brethren. I don't want God to hate me. <laughs> he says he hates you. Now look, if you're saved, he doesn't hate your soul. You're going to heaven, right? But he hates that wicked flesh that's doing that sin. And that person who that wicked flesh belongs to, the Bible says he hates you, right? Not your soul, not your spirit that's saved. But as he looks on you and you're sinning and you're causing discord and you're using your tongue to spread gossip and, and, and sometimes faults, and sometimes even if there's a little bit of truth in it, it's still doing a lot more damage than you should be doing. And the Bible says God hates you. Number two is this, gossip, are, the, the, those are the words that the Bible uses for the principle that we would call gossiping. Number two is this, gossiping is part of the old man, and it needs to be put off in a believer. If you're going to grow in Christian maturity, if you're going to grow spiritually and be conformed to the image of Christ, you're going to have to get rid of the gossip, okay? Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the, under, their, the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore, putting away, lying, speaking every man truth of his neighbor, for we are members one, uh, uh, one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he might, give to, uh, he might have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, and that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Colossians chapter 3 says something very, very similar. I'll just read it for you. It says, but you can go there if you want, but uh, Colossians 3 verse 8. But now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Right? The Bible says that charity covers a multitude of sins. I, I, I don't know if I'm quoting. This is the bond of perfectness. And I made a lot of mistakes in my life. Well, we better start loving people then. <laughs> better start showing some charity. Amen. Better start wanting souls to be saved. Amen. Better start to encourage your brothers with your tongue. Why? Because God looks at that and says, that's what I love. You know, you sow in discord, I hate you. <laughs> You're loving others and trying to lift them up and encourage them. He says, you know what? I think I can forgive your sins <laughs> because you're gracious and you're forgiving other people. Okay. Very important. Third point is this. <clears throat> Gossiping is a display of weakness, not strength. 
It's a display of weakness, not strength. You know, you could say, oh, yeah, Brother Rocky, you just, you're just a weak, you know, limp-wristed preacher. And so that's why you get up here, you got to preach about don't gossip. You're probably going to say love everybody and don't judge and all that kind of stuff because you're just too weak to get up here and call people out and say their names and, and rebuke them and, and, and tell everybody how wicked they are or whatever. No, 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 no. If you are showing meekness, you're acting like Christ. Amen. Moses, a meek man. You know what Moses could have done when... when Aaron and, and, uh, and Miriam, you know, uh, chewed him out <laughs> and started saying bad things about him. Man, he, he, was, he was a mighty man. He had a lot of power. He could have done a lot of things. Uh, you know, when, when, when all the Hebrews started murmuring and complaining, uh, I mean, he, you know, he showed a couple times. Like when he came down from the mountain, you know, he's sitting there trying to beg God to forgive those people. I know, you know, they're falling into wickedness and all that, but please forgive them, Lord. Just forgive them. And then he goes down and he sees them dancing around the golden calf and all that. And he, and he just gets mad, <laughs> grinds that thing powder and says, here, drink it. Right? He throws it upon the water. Drink. He was a mighty man. He had a lot of power. There's a lot that he could have done. But you know what? Meekness is knowing that you can do something and choosing not to do it. And I'm going to tell you right now, that takes a lot of strength. That's hard to do. You know, if somebody says something bad to you, it's so easy to say, oh, yeah, I'm wittier than you are. I can hurt you worse than you just hurt me. But a meek man says, you know what? I'm just going to take it. I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to let it roll off my back, and I'm going to keep pressing on for Jesus. <laughs> okay? That's what meekness is. It's not strength. It's not a display of how strong you are to get up there and start condemning people and, uh, and talking about their faults and, and destroying their ministry and all that kind of stuff. Now, again, time and a place for it, I understand. There is a time where you got to stand up for God and say, I'm not going to uh, just, just turn my back to this. This is somebody that a uh, situation that needs to be rebuked or whatever. But man, before you start saying, hey, I can show you three verses in the Bible that where, where, where it's Paul rebuked somebody by name and marked them. You know, John licked somebody by name. Oh, yeah, well, I can show you 50 that says keep your mouth shut <laughs> and mind your own business. <laughs> All right? So let's not look for those opportunities. Oh, yeah, well, well I can mark this person. I'm going to be righteous, and I'm, everyone's going to see how strong and so mighty of a man I am. No, no, no. To me, whenever I see it, that's a weak individual that's immature in faith and hasn't grown in Christ. And so they want to get up there and they want to use their tongue to destroy people. And that's not godly. That's not godly. I want to show us, I'm not, uh, I'm not down talking uh, women. Uh, I think I'm in good company here. We understand the Bible says that women are the weaker vessel. Am I right? Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5.13. <clears throat> talking about women, he says, and widow, he's talking about those who are uh, widows and they don't get married, they don't have a whole lot to do, they got a lot of free time on their hands, okay? And it says, and widow, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. What's he doing? He's talking about women, right? He's talking about women who don't have a whole lot to do, not, you know, they're not busy, so they become busy bodies, and they begin just tattling, and they begin spreading gossip and all that. And let's be honest. Like, to me, it's a very woman-type thing to be a gossiper, right? Uh, sorry. <laughs> There's not that many women in here, but, but uh, sorry, but it's true. And so, like, if you go on social media, I would expect, and I'm, I'll tell you right now, my wife and I, we share, uh, you know, anything that I put on an email, she gets, she, she can see it. She can check it real easy because all of our accounts are, are connected. Some people make fun of that. Hey, I'm, I, I'm good. <laughs> I like her to be able to see what I'm doing. Well, we share a Facebook account, right? So if I put something on Facebook or I'm talking to somebody, she sees that, right? So we, we, we have all that uh, together. But you know what she doesn't do? She doesn't go on Facebook and start destroying people and blah, 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 blah. Now she would if I let her. 
<clears throat> in fact, a couple times she did it without my permission and I deleted her comment and she was mad at me the rest of the day. <laughs> but here's why. Because I know the temptation, right? And I know if the woman's a weaker vessel, that's an area where a woman might be weak and the woman might say, oh yeah, let me at him. And she could say some hurtful and powerful things. And if you've ever been on Facebook, on some of these groups where all the people are talking, you can see they began to uh, just you know, share their mind, right? And they hurt people with the tongue. And next thing you know, everyone's deleting everybody from being friends on Facebook. And it's like, whew, that's terrible, right? Now, it should be, uh, I, can give you, I can give you some more verses, okay? Look at Titus. Titus chapter 2. You say, man, you're picking on women. Well, there's a reason. This is in the Bible. There's something about women being the weaker vessel. There's something about Titus 2, 3 says this. The aged women likewise, all right, he's given the different roles, all right, the aged men, be sober, grave, temperance, sound in faith, and charity and patience, verse 3, and the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. What's the first thing he says? Not false accusers, right? Because it's something that is maybe a tendency for a woman to do who's the weaker vessel. Now, that doesn't mean that all women are like that, for sure, but that would be something that they'd be prone to do, okay? Very emotional. Women are very emotional. And so it should be that a man who is not the weaker vessel is able to show some restraint when it comes to backbiting, tattling, and doing all those kinds of things. But you know what I see? Sometimes men are worse than women. <laughs> Gossiping when it comes to railing against other people and backbiting and spreading Discord, sowing discord and spreading gossip and all this. Sometimes men are worse. And it's like, I'm thinking, man, that's a display of weakness. You need to be strong and you need to say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to try to stop this from going that direction. I'm going to try to stop anybody's uh, name from being slung through the mud or their testimony being destroyed. Like, I don't, I don't want that for them. I want, they're my Christian brother, especially if they're your Christian brother. I want them to be uplifted. I want them to be corrected, maybe in privacy, and then they can, you know, be right. They can be restored. That's my desire. I don't have any desire to, to ruin their name, right? Okay, so the wife uh, is the weaker vessel. You might expect. Now, she should, look, be holy, <laughs> behave that way that which becometh holiness. But the husband should be expected to be maybe even above that, correct? He should be a little bit stronger. He should be able to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my tongue and I'm not going to gossip and I'm not going to do these things. But look, look, that's just the husband and the wife, average family, man, woman. What about pastors? Don't you think pastors ought to be even a higher level of maturity in Christ? And pastors ought to be able to control their tongue. And even when they hear others, you know, spreading gossip and everything, they should say, whoa, 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 we're not going to do that here. We're going to stop that from happening, right? Unfortunately, that's not what I'm seeing among a lot of pre preachers. You say, which preachers? I'm not going to tell you. You just want to gossip. <laughs> it's become kind of a trend, you know, and... and, and let me start with what we would call the new IFB. I, I feel like in many ways the new IFB is not so much a thing anymore. There's just We're just independent Baptists. But we know what I'm talking about when I say uh, uh, new IFB. <clears throat> Let's start there, okay? There seems to be this trend. You get up and you preach on a certain subject and everybody's waiting. You know, like, who's he preaching about? Who's he preaching about? And halfway through the sermon, he starts dropping names saying, this person has got to be kicked out. There just says blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, yeah, this guy's thinking, yeah, look at how brave I am. I can get up here, I can call out somebody's name. You're weak. You're not meek. You're not Christ-like. You're a little wuss. You're a wimp. To get up there and start dragging someone's name through the mud so that you can look better, that's not Christ-like. That's not Christ-like. That's certainly not manly. And that's certainly not pastoral. That's a big fault that we have in the new IFB. Okay? Oh, yeah, so the old IFB is so much better? You kidding? 
Here's what the old IFB would do. Yeah, 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 that new IFB, man. All they do is get up and rail on each other and kick each other out and all this kind of stuff. And they're preaching all this damnable heresy. And look, I don't even think they're saved. You hypocrite. <laughs> you just want to get up there and sling somebody's name through the mud. Right? How about we think about working together for the cause of Christ? Now, look, I'm not saying work with someone who's teaching false doctrine. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily need to be something that you shout from the rooftop either. Like, I'm not working with that guy because he preaches a false doctrine. Right? You've got to be real careful how you <clears throat> throw somebody's name out there as somebody who is wicked and somebody who we don't want anything to do with. You understand what I'm saying? It's using your tongue for good and not for evil. Amen. And before we start saying, yeah, yeah. Oh, those those new IFB churches. Yeah, 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 those old IFB churches. I'm glad we don't associate with this group and we don't associate too much. We associate with all groups that, that will work with us. <laughs> that, that group's not that huge, all right? But all those groups that will work with us, right? Uh, nice guys finish last, man. You're nice to this group. That group hates you. You're nice to this group. That group hates you. Hey, who cares? <laughs> God's on my side, right? <laughs> so, so anyway... Where was I going with that? <laughs> okay, but before we start saying, oh yeah, they're, uh, and those guys do it, but we don't do it. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. You know why? Because it's a product of the old man. It's a lust of the flesh. It's something that our body wants to do. It wants to cut other people down and make other people look bad so that we'll look good. And the Bible says we ought not to do that. Let's just pray. Father, I pray that you help us know when to use our tongue to stand up and boldly uh, rebuke somebody. But help us have wisdom to know that most of the time in our, the, that we're doing it in our flesh and we're actually causing harm. And help us have wisdom. You said, if any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask. And I pray, Lord, right now that you'll give each of us wisdom to know how to use our tongues properly. Help us to uh, to edify edify our brothers and sisters and use our tongue to preach the gospel and see people saved and sure help us to use our tongue to correct false doctrine and to point out error and all that lord but i pray that you'll keep us meek and humble help us to be to, to move on towards perfection and not to be hindered in the flesh lord and and, and display our weakness and our immaturity as christians lord help us grow and help us be more conformed to the image of Christ, I pray in Jesus' name.